so thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, so my name is Dr. Aaron Thierry. I, I'm an ecologist, uh, earth system scientist by training, um, and I am also a climate activist. So I, I was one of the founders for Scientists for Extinction Rebellion, and I've been um, in really involved in, in that as well. So um, tonight's talk is a follow on from last week's lecture, which you can find on YouTube. Um, and um, that's kind of setting out why it is that we're in a climate emergency. This week's lecture is more, what is it gonna to take to get out of that emergency? Uh, what do we have to do in order to limit warming uh, to, the, to the Paris Agreement targets? And with a focus on what does it mean for uh, fossil fuels and the uh, extraction of and burning of fossil fuels. And the case that I'm making tonight is really that, you know, we need to see an end to the fossil fuel era as quickly as possible. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm gonna be setting out. Um, as I said, there's gonna be questions at the end. So uh, if you've got any things uh, that you wanna ask then just jot them down and, and we'll get, get to them later. Okay, so <clears throat> last week's lecture, we finished on the, the notion that we're in an emergency. There are huge risks uh, from climate change and, and other environmental um, break, breakdown uh, issues. And basically all those risks increase as we continue to warm the planet. So um, th those uh, have been uh, kind of developed and, and we understand that now from, from the science and, and the world has kind of set a limit of warming that it says is unacceptable to, to warm beyond. Um, and you know that's there is a sense that there's an acceptable risk that we're going to take, and there's always a question of like who's that risk actually for? Who's taking on that risk? And and obviously there's a huge justice issue there around the fact that actually the people who are most vulnerable to the climate crisis have done the least to cause it, and those are the ones who are taking on the, the greatest share of the damages and are most exposed to these risks. Um, but as it is, the world has agreed that we're going to try and limit warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees, right? So that's what it says in the Paris Agreement. So this is just the, the key part from Article 2 in the Paris Agreement, which it says that, you know, the aim of the agreement is to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and that's in recognition of the fact that the, the risks that we face when we warm beyond those levels it, are extreme, right? We just don't want to go there. Um, this, that's a dangerous level of climate change. Now, <clears throat> what do we have to do in order to stop things getting that bad? What do we have to do is to, <laughs> in order to stop dangerous climate change, right? Well, we're already seeing <laughs> a certain amount of dangerous climate change. So how, how do we actually stop it from becoming catastrophic? <laughs> and this is kind of, pretty much the basics, right, that you hopefully will all know and, and is, you know, talk to, talk to school kids, right? But it's it's important that we just think about what what we can actually um, uh, know from, from, from this. So the greenhouse effect is, is well understood. Uh, it's telling us that as the planet um, is adding, um, you know, the, there's the sun's uh, light rays come and hit, hit the planet, the energy from that warms up the planet, uh, the planet then uh, reaches a, an equilibrium temperature and starts to radiate heat back into space in the infrared. Um, but there's certain gases in the atmosphere, greenhouse gases we call them, that trap uh, and block some of those infrared rays. Uh, so that means that the temperature of the planet increases. And obviously fossil fuels, uh, burning fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide, which is a really potent greenhouse gas. Uh, and as we've gone through the industrial revolution, we've put out more and more of these gases and now we're putting out roughly you know, 40 billion tons of, of these gases every, every year, it's a huge amount. Um, and that's obviously having it then an impact on the, on the temperature of the planet like we were talking about last week and the temperature of the planet has been going up accordingly. So it's pretty simple, right? Like, you know, there's these gases, they trap heat. If we put out more of them, the temperature goes up. And that's kind of what these graphs show. And uh, there are a few graphs in today's talk. So I'm gonna kind of break them down and go through them quite slowly um, and, and hopefully make sure that everybody kind of picks up on, on what they're telling us, right? So the first one here is showing us that, you know, the more greenhouse gases that we emit uh, over time, they accumulate, they build up in the atmosphere. Um, and then as that happens, then the concentration of those gases builds up in the atmosphere um, and, and you get a higher concentration of these gases those trap more heat and so the higher up the temperature goes it's it's that simple 
And so there's an interesting consequence of that, uh, which is very helpful for us in order to try and uh, um, uh, direct policy around this, which is that as the temperature, uh, sorry, as the cumulative carbon uh, levels go up, so does the temperature in proportion to that. And actually it's pretty much linear. And this was really uh, important because it then means that we can use that information to make predictions about how warm the world will get depending on how much emissions we put out. So this is from uh, the IPCC's report um, in the fifth assessment uh, five, um, uh, in 2013. And what it's showing you is this, this relationship as we understand it, right? So as cumulative CO2 emissions goes up, 500 billion tons, 1,000 billion tons, well, you know, one and a half thousand billion tons, then so does the temperature accordingly, right? Um, so roughly speaking, 1,000 gigatons, billion tons of carbon is equivalent to causing about two degrees of warming. So that then has an implication, right? <clears throat> so if we're trying to stabilize the temperature of the planet and stay below a certain level, that is we're trying to meet our uh, climate targets of staying below one and a half or two degrees Celsius of warming, then there's a cumulative amount of carbon we can emit. And so it depends on us limiting the total amount of emissions. But that then also has an implication about how much emissions we put out and how quickly we stop putting out emissions, right? So, <clears throat> you know, how fast we cut emissions to limit global warming is then the kind of the, the key factor. Um, and the longer we uh, emit, the, the higher the temperature goes. So one way of looking at that is, is a graph like this. So this is showing the total global emissions in billions of tons over time. And it's saying, if we'd peaked emissions in 2011 and brought them down along the green curve, we would have you know, had a, a good chance of staying below two degrees. Um, so <clears throat> you can see that you know, we would have still been emitting a little bit up to 2050, but we didn't stop in 2011. So we carried on putting up more emissions. Uh, but if we peaked in 2015, we could have come along down the, the blue curve instead, but then we'd have had to be at net zero around 2040 five or so, but again, we didn't, and we kept on emitting. We carried on increasing the amount of emissions. So by 2020, if we peaked that year, we'd have had to bring them down even more quickly uh, and then been at net zero by about 2040, right? So every time we delay, the action actually becomes more urgent and, and harder to achieve, right? It has, we have to have steeper, more urgent cuts to emissions. This is really important because what it tells us is that it's the cumulative amount of emissions that, that matter, i.e. we've got a carbon budget, there's only so much we can burn to stay below our targets. And this is rewriting the chronology of climate change. It's not about long-term gradual reductions in the future. It's not about 2050 or 20, you know, 2100. It's not about those targets. It's about urgent and radical reductions that have to start happening now. And that's, that's what we need to see. So another, another way of thinking about this and, and looking at this is um, using this graph, right? So this is showing you, again, along the, the bottom, the, the year that we peak emissions, and then uh, along the side is the climate target that we're aiming for, right? One and a half or two degrees. And then it tells you the rate at which we have to cut emissions in order to stay within that target, right? So if we peaked emissions about now, then already we are looking at having to achieve a rate of about 10% reductions per year in emissions in order to stay within the 1.5 degree target and about 5% a year in order to stay below, within the two degrees target, right? So already that's an incredibly demanding, challenging thing to do is to reduce emissions that much every single year. But if we wait, say 10 or 15 years, then things get harder. So, <clears throat> You know, in another decade from now, it'll be impossible at all to reach 1.5 degrees. And, you know, it'll be as hard as it is to reach 1.5 today uh, um, to reach two degrees, right? You'd have to have emissions cuts of about 10% a year. So every time we delay, every time we don't take action now, it means that we're more likely to miss our targets and it's going to get harder to reach them. And this is, this is what the carbon budget now looks like for 1.5, right? So if we if we'd started taking action 
10, 20, 30 years ago, things would have been a lot easier, right? We could have come down along these gentle yellow slopes. It would have still been a challenge, but it would have been much simpler. We've left it so late. There's been so much delay and so much, um, you know, um, um, you know, prevarication and, and, and inaction that we've now reached this point where, you know, you, emissions have to pretty much drop off a cliff if we're to try and stay within the budget for 1.5 degrees. It's almost impossible to reach, right? If we keep emitting the same amount as we're currently for another eight years, it will all be gone. So that's kind of the situation of where we are um, are now, and it's not, it's not looking good, right? And uh, last week we talked about this equation, which was kind of the sense of what, how to measure or define what an emergency is. And one of those parts of that equation was, you know, the risk uh, multiplied by the urgency and urgency was given by this idea of reaction time over the intervention time. And what you can see from these carbon budgets and, and the graphs that we were just looking at is that the intervention time is incredibly short now. We've got very little time left to intervene to stay within our climate targets and limit those damages. So as we were talking about last week, we want we want to stay below these temperature targets to, to limit damage. But now what it's clear is that we've got very little time left to do that. And this is from this week's IPCC assessment. So this is brand new. And what it's showing you is what the trajectory would look like for 1.5 degrees Celsius and for two degrees, right? Those really steep declining curves versus what our governments have actually pledged to do. So you can see here in the red line, uh, the kind of central estimate of where we're currently headed. And what it says is that, you know, implemented policies result in a projected emissions that lead to 3.2 degrees Celsius of warming with a range of 2.2 to 3.5. Now, remember last week we were talking about just how extreme 3, 3 to 3.5 degrees of warming really is, right? It's, it's actually most of the way to a whole ice age difference in terms of what it means for the planet. This is a really large amount of warming, even though the numbers sound quite small. It's going to completely transform the face of this planet. And that's currently where we're headed by the end of this century. <clears throat> and to get off that trajectory would require much steeper emissions reductions, as we can see uh, from the blue and the green curves here. Because those curves are so hard to meet, what we've actually seen is that people are increasingly talking about the need for negative emissions, because what a negative emission allows is for us to, to actually draw down CO2 from the atmosphere. And as this graph shows us, um, you can see, <clears throat> you know, I'll show it to you again, right? the amount of emissions we can put out into the atmosphere can be increased if we then reduce them afterwards and draw them down um, from the atmosphere. <clears throat> so a lot of uh, climate scenarios, climate models now are, are assuming that we're gonna be able to do this in the future. And that means that we're trying to delay taking action in the present in, on, the, on the promise that we're gonna make up for it later. Um, Unfortunately, <clears throat> there's not a guarantee at all that these technologies are going to work in the ways that we hope they might. So as this paper says, there's actually a real risk that we're taking on by pretending or assuming that these technologies are going to solve our problems for us, right? As, as the paper says, there is a real risk they will be unable to deliver on the scale of their promise. If the emphasis on equity and risk aversion embodied in the Paris Agreement are to have traction, negative emissions technologies should not form the basis of the mitigation agenda. This is not to say that they should be abandoned. They could very reasonably be subject of research, de development, and potentially deployment, but the mitigation agenda should proceed on the premise that they will not work at scale. And that means that we haven't got large budgets at all, right? We have to take urgent radical steps now. We can't <clears throat> hope that it's gonna be solved for us later. We have to take action in, in the near term. And as Professor Robert Watson, the former IPCC's co-chair has said, you know, relying on these untested carbon dioxide removal mechanisms to achieve the Paris targets, when we have the technologies to transition from fossil fuels today is foolhardy and wrong. You know, we have the wind power, we have the solar panel power that we could substitute and switch to, and, and, and you know, lots of other technologies and, and changes to behavior that we could make, 
but if we if we bank on solving this problem through negative emissions technologies, we could get into a really big uh, pickle later on. The other thing that we really have to think about is around how is this carbon budget, if we've only got a fixed amount of carbon that we can burn, how is this carbon budget divided between all the world's nations? What would be a fair share? <clears throat> now, in the Paris Agreement, it's really clear about this as well, right? So it says we should aim to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, but that we should do it in a way that is implemented to reflect equity and the principle of common but differentiated differentiated responsibilities. So equity and fairness is at the heart of the Paris Agreement. What does that mean for carbon budgets? Well, there's been a lot of science that's looked at this and, and tried to come up with ways of allocating this budget according to different um, you know, rules and, and judgments. Um, these are all value judgments, right? They're all kind of making up decisions as to what is the most ethical way of dividing this this budget up or what's a fair reasonable way which is all a, a judgment right so it's it's science is kind of being guided here by by different um ethics and, and frameworks of, of of politics but the key thing is is that they all pretty much say something quite similar right so i'm just going to pick one of these studies uh to, to kind of highlight what what the findings are so this on the left here we've got the carbon budget so the emissions of CO2 per year in gigatons over time. And the dotted line shows what would have to happen if we were to stay below uh, 1.5, right? Or to have a 75% chance of two degrees. Um, this one is showing us uh, what would uh, the pathway would have to be uh, for a two degrees pathway, but with a 66% chance of staying below that. And what you can see is that, you know, this, this one's smaller than this one, but uh, this is what the US has promised to do. This is what the EU's promised to do. This is what China's promised to do. This is what India's promised to do. And then this is what's then left for the rest of the world, right? And likewise on this side. And what you can see is that if we assume that, you know, the, the developed nations are going to take on the share that they claim that they're going to take on and their targets out to 2050, then basically they're assuming that the rest of the world is, is not going to have any carbon to burn at all. And obviously these are the countries that have burnt the least carbon historically, uh, um, whereas you know, the developed countries have, have historically burnt the most. And so there's a real ethical and justice uh, uh, implications here. It's kind of, again, an inversion of, of, of this notion of equity, right? It's actually the, the other way around, um, which um, kind of shows us again, you know, even, even under the two degrees one, then it's assuming that the rest of the world would have to stop burning all fossil fuels by 2030, even as the US and the EU keep burning uh, fossil fuels out to 2050. So <clears throat> this is kind of really pointing out to us that, you know, if we don't take equity into consideration, then what we see is that certain countries start to take a lion's share of the remaining carbon budget. Professor Kevin Anderson, who's a, a climate scientist at the University of Manchester and, and studies these kind of uh, budgets and how to share them, has looked at the UK and 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 focused very much on on their own on our own carbon targets here in the UK, and and what he says is that you know the UK is taking far more than its fair share, right? So the scale of the failure seemingly locked into the UK's climate progressive legislation really becomes evident when played out at a global level. If every nation failed to deliver their respective Car Paris compliant carbon budget by a factor similar to that of the UK. The global emissions would relate to holding the temperature rise to well below 2.6 to 3 degrees and pursuing 2 to 2.3, right? So actually, that's not that far from what we're actually doing, right? As a globe, right? That's what the IPCC is saying. We're pretty much on track to three. And he's saying, you know, if every country did what the UK is doing, we'd be on track to three. You know, we're not aligning as a globe to the 1.5 to 2 degrees. And we're not aligning to that as the UK either. And actually, it's probably even worse than that, because if you actually look at the policies in the UK, and there was a report published this week that kind of added up all the policies for net zero in the UK and said, you know, if we uh, look how much of the emissions reductions that we need uh, are currently, um, you know, under uh, confirmed policy, and you can see that that's in the green. And it's only about 25% of all the emissions reductions that we need currently have policy in place to meet those reductions. The rest are either under consultation, have been uh, outlined as possible things that we might do, or there's no policy at all in place, right? 
Uh, and so for certain sectors in particular, transport, um, you know, we're way off track there. Uh, likewise with agriculture as well and land use, we're, we haven't got very many policies at all in place to deal with, with those emissions, right? So as, as a country, the UK, you know, we've got these, these targets, but we're not on track to meet them. And this is data actually that the government have released themselves uh, showing, you know, in, in the uh, purple line here, um, what our projections are for the UK uh, out to 2040. Uh, and comparing that to our carbon budget in the red, um, which is, is blocked into five year periods. Um, and we're supposed to be reducing emissions each time, right? And you can see by 2035, we're looking to be 100% over our budget. We'll be emitting 100%, so twice, what we should be doing in 2035 with current policies, right? Um, and, you know, that's budget, as I just said, is already taking a lion's share of the global budget, right? So, you know, we're not even on track to meet that. And, and that's the kind of the, the horrible situation that we're in in the UK right now. And, and the UK is calling itself a climate leader. So, it's, I mean, that's just a joke, really. Um, but then the question becomes, well, what about oil and gas? And, and, you know, what about fossil fuel exploration? Do we have all the fossil fuels that we need already? Or, or does it still make sense to explore for any, any new ones? Uh, you know, we're going to be emitting a little bit uh, into the future as we, as we decarbonize. Do we, do we need fossil fuels to help us do that? And the answer is a resounding no, not at all. Uh, and that's what the rest of the talk is just going to look at now. So uh, this was a paper published a few years ago, I think 2014. Um, and what it looked at was, you know, the commitment to emissions from the existing fossil fuel reserves and exploration, right? So it says, our analysis suggests that continuing to invest in exploration and extraction technologies to expand current proven reserves is inconsistent with a two degrees climate target. Instead, we will very likely need to decrease the current commitment to future CO2 emissions by leaving some economically viable fossil fuel reserves in the ground, right? So we've known this for quite a while, that in order to even meet a two degree target, let alone a 1.5 degree target, we have to leave fossil fuels in the ground um, and not, not go out and dig them up. A more recent paper published in 2021 looked at how much would have to be left in the ground if we were to meet a 1.5 degree target. And this even allows for some negative emissions as well, right? And what it says is that by 2050, we find that nearly 60% of oil and fossil methane gas and 90% of coal must remain unextracted to keep within a 1.5 degree carbon budget. So that's saying the vast majority of fossil fuels that we already have found, already have on the books of companies has to stay unburned. We can't dig it up, we can't burn it. So that's, uh, you know, if, we, if we've already got too much, then there's no need for any more whatsoever. And this is the kind of clear message now that we're getting from all around the world, uh, scientists and, and all institutions that, that study this. You know, this is the in, uh, director of <clears throat> um, the International Energy Agency, Dr. Fatih Birol. And he's saying, if governments are serious about the climate crisis, there can be no new investment in oil, gas and coal from now. From this year, and he said that in 2021 before the Paris, uh, before the Glasgow uh, meeting. In um, <clears throat> so you know, th this is uh, you know very much an establishment point of view that you know if you're serious about meeting the Paris Climate Agreement, there can be no new investments in oil, gas, and coal. The UN uh, Environment Programme have done a report on this as well, uh, which they call the production gap. And they look at how much fossil fuels will be being produced on current trends out to 2030 compared to what would have to happen to reach the 1.5 to 2 degrees goal. So in the same way, the red is showing you here that what we're currently headed towards on current plans. The green is what would have to happen to fossil fuel production if we were to stay within 2 degrees. And the blue is what would have to happen to fossil fuel production if we were to stay within 1.5 degrees. And we're currently on track to produce twice more than twice the amount of fossil fuels uh, then would be consistent with the 1.5 degrees target, right? That's it, that's how far off track we are already. Um, this is showing you the graph for it broken down by coal, oil, and gas. And you can see for all three of them, we'd have to be reducing uh, production rather than increasing it. <clears throat> now, you know, fossil fuel companies say they're taking action and aligning their business plans 
with with climate change uh, and and the Paris Agreement, but actually the evidence is that they're completely not right. They're actually going in the other direction. A lot of them. So, um, you know, this is a, a report by Oil Change International that looked at all the business plans for these different companies, looked at what they were currently investing in, um, BP, Chevron, Equinor, ExxonMobil, Shell, and so on, and it finds that. As oil and gas companies claim to be part of the solution to the climate crisis, the reality couldn't be more different. None come close to aligning their actions with the urgent 1.5 degrees Celsius global warming limit as outlined by the Paris Agreement, right? None of them. <clears throat> Likewise, they're looking to continue to expand fossil fuels, right? Like I said, they've already got more on their books than they can burn if we're to meet the target. They should be leaving it in the ground un un uh, uh, and not digging it up. Instead, they're spending billion, uh, uh, billions of dollars to go and look for more. So <clears throat> this is a recent analysis uh, that was done by Global Witness and Rystad. Uh, and what they find is that, um, you know, almost a trillion dollars of investment is going to be made into new oil and gas projects in the next decade uh, if they have their way, right? If we don't manage to, to um, actually change course. And so, um, you know, this is what the these companies are planning on doing currently and, and what they have to be stopped from doing basically. And it's been basically all of all of this is costing, you know, like I said, hundreds of billions of, if not almost a trillion dollars of investment. Where's that coming from? Well, it's coming from banks mostly, right? So we, we see banks like JP Morgan, uh, Citi, uh, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, in Europe, Barclays is one of the largest investment banks who are financing these fossil fuel projects um, and they're doing so because it's legal to do so right now right they're not <laughs> being prevented from doing so by government regulation or legislation and so at the moment these banks just keep in increasing their their investments in fossil fuel companies <clears throat> so we're in an absolutely crazy and dangerous situation uh, it's it's insane wh where we're headed um, and as um Mark Campanale, the CEO of a, an organization called Carbon Tracker, who has basically set up what they call the Global Registry of Fossil Fuels to look at all the kind of the uh, the reserves that we currently have uh, and, and kind of quantify that for each um, each country and, and then compare that to our carbon budget. And they find that we have seven times more than we would need uh, that, uh, to stay within 1.5 degrees, right? So seven times more. So. When we're in a situation, he says, where you've got two, three, four times more fossil fuels in development for the remaining carbon budget, then that tells you that policy is more than slightly out of sync. It is fundamentally out of sync. Our governments are not on top of this situation. We are not at all headed towards the promises that they made uh, at Paris and then again at Glasgow. What about in the UK? If we just look at home, well, uh, again, the science is really clear. Um, you know, there is no new uh, North Sea oil and gas licenses um, that are, that, sorry, new oil and gas licenses in the North Sea would be incompatible with UK climate goals. So, you know, this report from 2020 said, uh, 2022 said, there is no need for new oil and gas fields in the UK. And another report by a different group uh, published in October 2022 says, if the UK claims to be a climate leader, it cannot allow these new fields to start up nor hold a new licensing round, right? The science on this is really clear. The messages have been put out there. They've been given to government. Scientists have communicated exactly what has to happen. And even the UK government's own advisors, the Cl Climate Change Committee have said this too, right? So the Climate Change Committee, it's, uh, this is from a letter that they sent to the government. The, the Climate Change Committee would support a tighter limit on production with stringent tests and a presumption against exploration they also add that an end to UK exploration would send a clear signal to investors and consumers that the UK is committed to the 1.5 degrees Celsius temp global temperature goal, right? And what happened after they sent this letter? Well, the UK defied the climate warnings by going out and licensing over 100 new oil and gas licenses, right? Our government is not listening to the science. It is not following scientific advice. It is not aligning its... Uh, targets to, and its policies to meet the climate targets that we've promised the world that we're going to set, right? There, There is a huge amount of, of spin, lies, distortion, greenwash. And just to show you what I mean by that, here's the um, Minister for Climate, Graham Stewart, talking just a few weeks ago to the Conservative Environment Network. <clears throat> 
hopefully this is going to be audible to you all. We have a diverse energy supply with uh, uh, the North Sea Basin uh, still producing oil and gas. We're net importers, but I think the North Sea has a serious role to play for years to come. I don't see, just to deal with a, uh, a topical uh, issue, I don't see uh, new oil and gas licenses in that mature and declining basin as being against our net zero commitments. On the contrary, we are driving the greening of that production with the industry voluntarily uh, committing to a 50% reduction in emissions from production uh, by 2030. And the idea that it's uh, morally superior while we are burning gas, and we will be burning even in 2050, about 25% of the gas we burn today, the idea that if we import it with higher emissions, much higher emissions attached to those imports, not from Norway, but from the LNG, which is the more optional element, that that is somehow morally superior than producing our own, is environmentally nonsensical. It goes against the uh, financial interests of the United Kingdom, and it risks major oil companies, BP, Shell, and other players, removing their balance sheets, their interest, their engineering capability, their subsea capability, exactly the facilities and capabilities we need to harness in order to deliver hydrogen, carbon capture, and the like. So we, on the conservative side, uh, while doing more than any previous government, in fact, any other government in the world, I would suggest, are nonetheless doing so in a way which I think appeals to common sense and delivers prosperity in a, in a sustainable way. You know, as you can see, his definition of common sense is completely different to what the scientists are saying. But also, <clears throat> you might have noticed that there was, there was a kind of an industry talking point greenwash put in there as well, with them promising to reduce emissions by... 50% from production by 2030, right? It sounds like they're reducing emissions. Actually, that's just saying that they're going to, to um, be um, more efficient with the way that they're producing it, right? That's not saying they're going to reduce their emissions overall at all. Um, it's, the, it's dropped in there to kind of mislead uh, the audience, right? <clears throat> and this is from just today. There was a, a response to a recent uh, um, Commons uh, Environment Audit Committee report that had suggested that the government set a, a date for when it's going to stop exploration in the North Sea. Um, and the government's response was, no way, we're not going to do that. So you can see in this um, paragraph 74, supporting our domestic oil and gas sector is not incompatible with tackling climate change um, when we know we will need oil and gas for decades to come. Uh, likewise, in paragraph 75, they say, um, you know, it would not be helpful environmentally, economically, or in terms of maintaining offshore skills in the transition to reduce domestic production, where this merely increases our dependency on imports. You know, again, it's misleading, right? Like, you know, we should be substituting all of this fossil fuel uh, for, for renewable energy as quickly as possible. And, and yet they're kind of keeping us tied into fossil fuels for longer. All of that means that we're no, not going to meet our climate pledges. But unfortunately, it's not just the UK that's doing this, right? We just saw last week that the Biden administration, despite promising not to, has gone out and allowed <coughs> new uh, uh, development of oil and gas in the Arctic. A new, a new pipeline uh, is going to be built there too. Likewise, you know, they've now uh, the US has reached record highs in terms of its natural gas output this year. Um, a lot of that's going to be. <coughs> um, we're, we're seeing uh, China even expanding, um, you know, new coal mines uh, uh, and coal plants being being expanded there. Canada's expanding oil and gas production from the, the tar sands, right? If every country is doing this and the UK is one of them, then then we're never going to meet our climate targets, right? Every country is is just trying to uh, maximize its own uh, uh, revenues here, uh, its own uh, extraction. N none of them are kind of working together to to reduce emissions and as we said last week you know we're, we're in this crazy situation where political reality is now completely divorced from the physical reality of the climate crisis and as professor hans schellenhuber has said political reality must be grounded in physical reality or it's completely useless our current governments are completely useless when it comes to tackling the climate crisis and it's putting us all in danger and this is why Myself and, and others from Scientists for Extinction Rebellion uh, last April protested outside of the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, as it was called then. Uh, this was a few days after the IPCC's sixth assessment report came out, 
uh, where we it said very clearly that, that we have to leave most fossil fuels in the ground if we're to meet the 1.5 target. Um, and yet a few days later, the government announced it was going to be doing this new licensing round. And, and, you know, we were just outraged by this. We said this is completely, completely wrong in terms of, um, you know, fulfilling their promises. It goes against all scientific advice. And so we went and we, we stuck the scientific papers to the windows of the department uh, that, that set out, you know, what, what, the, what we just looked at just now and, and said, look, you know, we are not going to stand by and let you do this unchallenged. And a few of us, um, including myself, we were arrested at, at that protest, um, you know, because we felt so strongly about this, because it's so important that we don't develop these new uh, oil and gas resources. In fact, we have to leave most of the ones that we already have in the ground. And, and you know, if, if we can't even do that, then there's absolutely no chance that we're going to meet our climate targets. And as Antonio Guterres, <coughs> um, the UN Secretary General, has said, you know, climate activists are sometimes depicted as dangerous radicals, but the truly dangerous radicals are the countries that are increasing the production of fossil fuels. Investing in new fossil fuels infrastructure is moral and economic madness. You know, and unfortunately, that means he's talking about our government, right? The UK are truly dangerous radicals. You know, they are <clears throat> carrying out this act of huge harm knowingly in, with all the information from science that has been given to them and they're continuing to invest in this new infrastructure, that's madness, right? This, it's moral and economic madness what they're doing. Especially when you then consider the fact that we have all the technologies that we need to get out of this mess, right? We have seen absolutely phenomenal decreases in the price of solar and wind. They're now by far the cheapest forms of energy. We should be rolling them out as quickly as possible whilst reducing energy demand as much as we can. You know, we could get off fossil fuels really quickly if we did that, but instead the, the, the governments are continuing to lock us in to continue fossil fuel use. <clears throat> so why are they doing this? Why are they acting so contrary to all scientific advice when we have options to get us out of this mess? Uh, and this paper by Isaac Stoddard and, and, and colleagues looked at this question. Um, it's a really great paper. I do recommend it. It's quite a long paper, but it's it's full of detail, right? And it's called Three Decades of Climate Mitigation. Why haven't we bent the global emissions curve? And their answer is it's power. It's the power of the fossil fuel industries and, and other powerful vested interests in society. So, for example, they say political action to mitigate climate change has also been slowed at the regional, national and international levels through direct lobbying by fossil fuel companies and through the funding of political actors Regions that rely on fossil fuel jobs uh, and revenues find it particularly difficult to withstand such lobbying attempts. Research by Influence Map shows how fossil fuel companies have lobbied to weaken climate policies around the world and have continued to do so whilst claiming to be uh, aligning with the Paris Agreement. Right? These companies are, are blocking progress and, and they're undermining our democracy. And what we're seeing is now, I would say, the corporate capture of our government. That means that our government is acting for the benefit of these companies against the benefit of people and the planet. There's a whole network uh, of ways in which they do this. This has been now documented very clearly by various different soci sociologists and, and investigative journalists, but it basically works through, through spending lots of money, right? These corporations are the, some of the wealthiest companies that there have ever been, uh, and they're using those profits to, uh, to, to delay action and continue making loads of big big bucks, right? So they set up foundations, they, they finance think tanks, universities, trade associations, advertising agencies, advocacy organizations to, to basically push their, their agenda. Um, they then, you know, get into the conservative media, they, they, they um, buy up lobbying firms to, to go and, um, you know, get onto, to, uh, in, into parliamentary uh, meeting rooms. They fund parliamentary campaigns. Uh, um, you know, if you look at the United States, you know, hundreds of millions have been spent on funding uh, Congress, congressional races um, uh, in order to make sure that politicians who are going to act on, on the interests of the fossil fuel companies are elected, right? And that then shapes the public agenda, it shapes the media agenda, it then ultimately it shapes the political agenda, and that determines what the policy outcomes that we're seeing are. So until we challenge and get rid of this corporate capture and, and, and the roles of these fossil fuel interests, we're going to keep seeing them delaying action and taking us towards disaster. As it says in, in this really excellent book that's just been published uh, not long ago, um, 
the industry, the, the fossil fuel industry has shifted from denying climate change to a form of what they call predatory delay uh, in defending the current carbon dependent economic system for as long as possible. They're just trying to slow down the transition as much as possible. So we argue that the failure of climate change mitigation can be attributed both to the corporate orchestrated delay in transition and ultimately to the defense of the hegemony, which they mean is the status quo, right? This, everything is directed at keeping things as they are and slowing down the transition that we so desperately need. What's the answer? How do we get out of this mess? Well, this paper, um, the three decades of climate mitigation paper, basically says what we need is social movements, right? That's our hope. So how can we, how can existing and new social movements mobilize popular power and social imaginaries in a way that can effectively challenge the status quo and helps drive structural change at the scale and pace required? <clears throat> so just to, to, to wrap up now, um, what I really kind of want to leave you with is the sense of urgency, the sense of, um, you know, what's at stake. Um, and I think this, this one st statistic for me really sums it up. We're currently headed for three degrees of global warming, right? That's what the UN's uh, latest assessment says. If we look at all the fossil fuels and the books of these companies, if we add them all up and, and burn them all, we're going to be headed to three degrees or more, right? If we reach three degrees, this is what it looks like to the planet, right? Currently, today, in 2020, 0.8% of the world's surface has a mean annual temperature of over 29 degrees Celsius. This is mostly in the Sahara Desert, right? This is home to almost nobody. There's a, only a few million people live in these regions. They're incredibly inhospitable. Um, you know, this is not conducive to, to human uh, flourishing, right? Yet, if we carry on warming to three degrees, which could be as soon as 2070, then this is what the planet looks like. You know, throughout the tropics, we're gonna see areas over 29 degrees Celsius. So 19% of the Earth's surface, currently home to 3 billion people. You know, we're talking about huge areas across the Indian subcontinent, Southeast Asia, um, you know, throughout the Amazon, um, which, which would basically not survive under those temperatures uh, as, as an ecosystem. We talked last week about the possible tipping point in the Amazon, right? This is a complete disaster, right? This is, this is unimaginably horrendous in terms of what it means for human livelihoods, well-being, the numbers of people who are going to be displaced, who are going to be killed, the turmoil that this is going to bring to global civilization and, and, and our global societies. It's beyond really even uh, thinking about, right? We are only a few decades away from here, and now is the time to take action to avoid this. If we don't succeed in, in taking action in the next few years to drastically reduce emissions, and, and that means leaving most fossil fuels in the ground, we, win, we are heading to this uh, this century. So, you know, I think you guys know this more than anybody, but for me, you know, I've got to do everything I can to try and stop that uh, reality from from becoming that 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 vision from becoming reality that 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 risk right so you know it is right to save humanity right that's what we've got to focus on we've got to put all our efforts into doing that right it is wrong to pollute this planet it is wrong to destroy so many lives and livelihoods it is wrong to take away the conditions that support all our human rights you know we have got to resist this and it is right to give hope to future generations. We have got to keep going. We've got to keep inspiring people. And we've got to keep mobilizing people. And as Rebecca Solnit has said, and I think I'm gonna leave you with this quote, because uh, for me, it really touches me and it, and it motivates me. To hope is to gamble. It is to bet on the future, on your desires, on the possibility that an open heart and uncertainty is better than gloom and safety. To hope is dangerous. And yet it is the opposite of fear. <clears throat> For to live is to risk. I say all this to you because hope is not like a lottery ticket you can sit on the sofa and clutch feeling lucky. I say this because hope is an axe that you break down doors with in an emergency, because hope should shove you out the door, because it will take everything you have to steer the future away from endless war, from the annihilation of the Earth's treasures, and the grinding down of the poor and the marginal. Hope just means that another world might be possible, not promised, not guaranteed. Hope calls for action. Action is impossible without hope. Thank you very much.